have we have some spies that are watching us right now. Tracy Ware and Stephanie McGovern. They're yeah. watching us. Yeah. 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 Good. I should tune them out, shouldn't I? And take them off. They, they need to watch us. Yeah. We'll call them out. I know, you know, you just gotta calm him down sometimes. It's just, you know, he, he gets too, too <laughs> radical for this church, you know, and we're yeah. a very quiet church. Yeah, quiet. You know, yeah. that's, that's not us yeah, he, he, at all. Let me go turn on my camera. Uh, sure. Hallelujah. When we are in our third night, and um, it's um, it's been even better than I thought it'd be, and so I know tonight. And and, and uh, what's this? Today's Tuesday, right? Yes, sir. Oh, we have two more nights. Okay, cool. Um, uh, oh, and I, I am I am expecting and believing God for just more and more prophetic word to come from you guys. Um, that's the kind of church that we are, and so we'll keep that going. Also, Dave brought over the. Um, Copy so, uh, y'all. These are awesome. So y'all can grab these as as the night goes on. Um, that's what we use for communion now. It's the official ESC communion pamphlet. It's awesome. So, oh man, let's see here. Um, I have to pray whether or not I'm going to share this tonight because I got to just and I guess since I'm talking about it, I could pray for us. But, but, um, okay, oh, okay, well, yeah, sorry, good. Um, okay, before we move here, and I'm kind of going off task too, and I'm not saying that, that this church is the church, but I'm just saying that we were called here for a purpose. And um, before we moved here, um, the Lord gave me numerous, numerous visions on what was going on in Vegas. And one of them in particular was the fact that he's, um, I had a dream and I saw a huge field. It was just full of green, green grass. And there was a fence. So like big, huge field. And there was a fence just like this. And there were just all these deer running wild. And they were all young deer, and they were does. Those were females, and and spikes. Spikes are like one-year-old males, and their spikes are just stupid, and they, and they run everywhere. <laughs> and so, but on the other side of the fence, there were all these old deer. And my wife and I got chills on Saturday and and on last night. But I there's a couple things that were said. And um, the dream I had was. There were very large male deer called bucks, and they had l large heads, but very, very small, fragile horns. And in the deer world, that's malnutrition. Uh, they look old, they look tired. And so he told me that that was the picture of the pastors in this city, okay? And so when Mike, Mike, do you remember what you told me Saturday night about how the fish look at 10,000 feet in that pond? Yeah. And what did you tell me? Well, you said they, they, fish up there don't have anything to eat. So they have nothing they to eat. Develop. They have just the big mouths and heads and little bitty bodies. And no bodies. No bodies. And you said that, and I just got chills. Really? And then, Diana, do you remember what you said last night? Mm-hmm. Malnutrition. Malnutrition. Malnourished. And so the more and more we hear that, and, and what was, you know, again, that's just the Lord confirming our place here. And again, I'm not this Bible scholar. I'm not someone who's very mighty, but, but okay, God, I, what that does for me is a confirmation even more so. And we keep getting more and more confirmation about being here, especially since, since we were starting our 12th year here. My wife reminded us of that yesterday. So with, with, with prophetic word, it edifies it confirms, it leads, 
it adjusts, okay? And so I don't want us, and I said this for, I think we've been doing these for about five years. I, I, I don't want us to ever be afraid of uh, prophetic words, but also respect them for what they are. They are the word of God to his people to edify. They're never damaging, hurtful. They're always to edify. And so through, through the night, tonight, tomorrow night, Thursday night, not if, but when you have a word, let me know. This is the atmosphere to share that. The atmosphere for um, edification, for, for glorification of the Lord. And so um, that's what I'm, I know that's what God wants in this church. And since this is his church, not mine, I'm going to obey him. And so that's really, really important. Um, so with that in mind, does anyone have any words that they want to share tonight? Well, can I say something to Brother Jim? Of course. Cool. Hey. You talked last night. Hold on, hold on. No, no, no. no. You got to have Mr. Mike. <laughs> okay, you talked about um, to, to take back, like, make your marriages and take back your children. <coughs> so when you said your children, I just said, oh, you know, because it, it went right to my spirit. You know, so on the way home, I'm arguing with the Lord about this. You know? <laughs> and I said, you told me, I said, you sent two people to me told, telling me, not to worry about my children because as long as I was doing what I was supposed to be doing and working for him and doing things in the kingdom, that he would take care of my children for me. And so then I said, so what does this mean with Pastor Jim when he said that? So I, you know, so what, what's up with it? And so he said, he said, um, he said, I told you, he said, I will bring him back. And so just to uh, give a little praise report, I didn't find out until Sunday afternoon, but I went over to my son's house, and his girlfriend has been going to church for four weeks. Really? Praise with God. With a couple of my grandkids. So it's Praise a start, God. you know? And oh my that's gosh. a biggie in my family. That's huge. Because even Dave said, well, he said, wow, it's Jim because he's been going to church. He goes, she's going. So he goes, do you know where she's going? I go, oh, yeah, I know. I know exactly where she's going. And I said, I don't care because she's going. Amen. So praise God. Amen. You know, she has, if she's going clear across town with, with another, uh, you know, friends that I know, a young kid. But he knows the Lord, so he has uh, invited her to come, so they've been coming, you know. So to me, baby steps, and it's working, I just said, thank you, God. So Hallelujah. after he had told me that, I thought, okay, I'll feel so bad. <laughs> but thank you for the word anyway, because it, it is true. Because we have to remember that um, when we give, when we, uh, we can't take back what we don't give out. Amen. So I know I had put out, put out to my kids so they all know, you know. But when you said, you, you got to take it back. I'll just uh, go on with that. Um, because I, I thought, you know, uh, being all in doesn't really have a whole lot to do with physically uh, as they're uh, going across the Grand Canyon. And so I thought, I'll just give my own testimony of what all in is to me. Uh, I didn't come to Christ until I was 38 years old. I was serving for the Lord. I studied Buddhism, Hinduism, all the isms of the world. <laughs> I was looking for the truth. I knew that you know, if there wasn't an ultimate truth, uh, life was just totally meaningless. So 38 years of looking for the Lord, go to a church over in Boulder City, an old red-headed guitar picker, said, if you got any problems, just open your heart a crack and uh, ask Jesus to come in. I hadn't tried that yet. So I did. Didn't answer no salvation call. Didn't think anything had happened. Walked out of the church. But guess what? The Holy Spirit came in. Hallelujah. So the Bible, the 
as Pastor said last night, this is the Holy Word of God. It used to put me to sleep. If I, if I wanted to go to sleep, all I had to do was pick up a Bible and try to read it. You know, I couldn't understand any of it. I started picking up the Bible. Couldn't put it down. I knew I'd found the truth. And I couldn't turn it loose. Well, the wife, my wife, she had uh, actually a whole uh, hallway in our house with books that she had kept since she was about probably 14 years old. You know, that was her pride and joy. There was everything from I'm okay to you're okay, you're okay to actually white witchcraft, <laughs> all kinds of spiritual books. So in her, her way, she was looking for God just like I was. But when I became a Christian, she didn't want any part of it. And she actually said, if you don't quit going to that church, I'm going to divorce you. And uh, she's like, okay, God, <laughs> you got me into this. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to get me out of it. I knew I'd found the truth. I knew I couldn't turn loose. So it's like I was all in. Looking at possibly a divorce, divorce of 38 years. Uh, a divorce would have meant half of my retirement. My retirement would have had to be sold. Half of it would have gone to her. Uh, she would have got the house and the kids, and uh, I would have got the rest of the world outside the house. <laughs> so. I asked, God, what do I go from here? What do I do? And he led me to the scripture. It's Mark 9, 62. Any man sets his hand to the plow, turns to look back, not fit for the kingdom of God. Not particularly what I wanted to hear, but, you know, I asked God, he answered me found something that I could depend on. Amen. Something worth being all in for. And so this battle went on between my wife and I for possibly four years. Um, point where she even moved out of the house. And uh, it was uh, probably one of the most miserable times in my life because to me, all I really wanted to be was a good father and a good husband. And it was all going out the window. But I was all in. I found something that I, I, I would risk my life for. And so I tried to witness to my wife trying to get her to see the truth. And uh, I asked God, you know, what do I do? You know, this isn't working. And he said to me, we're alone. God, somebody's going to have to tell her about Jesus. Somebody is going to have to lead her to Christ. He said, leave with me. Like what you said, Debbie. He said, leave her to me. Amen. Amen. And, uh, okay. And so I just pulled back, kept going to church, kept reading my Bible. And uh, in that process, God led me to the scripture.
And this is really, this is what it's all about. Where you all in. And I, I have a new King James, but I like the, uh, the NIV in this particular scripture because it starts out, love is patient. Here it says, love suffers on. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Amen. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Bearing all things. Believing all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Love never fails. God said it. I believe you. Love never fails. Amen. So I'd like to always, when I talk about this, a lot of our life is about definition of words. We've let the world redefine what love is. Mm -hmm. The scripture here, love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, does not boast. That's God's description of what love is. Well, I was trying to be patient. I didn't know how impatient I was <laughs> until I started to do Patience, like God says, patience is to be done. And I found out that I can have a quiet exterior, but inside of me, things are, there, it's not moving. I've got to do something. I've got to change this. I've got to force something to happen one way or the other. Uh, if, you, if you'll just quit talking, I'll tell you what the truth is. You know? <laughs> so, God, I, I can't live like that. This is impossible for a person to do. That's when I found out about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Don't think you're ever going to be all in unless you have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Because what God asks us to do is human possible in my own effort I couldn't be that patient wait four years for something to happen but it's a long story like I said this this process took at least four years but my wife He's in heaven now. He knelt down in front of the TV. He said, Jesus, if you're God like Jim says you are, come into my heart. My heart was real good. One of the most powerful prayer person, prayer warriors I ever met in my life. My son was with her one day when she cast a demon out of somebody at the the uh, Grapevine Church, outside the church, there was no, he was all in. Amen. And uh, this is a little side note, God told me, when she gets saved, she'll embarrass you. Well, she did. I mean, she, <laughs> she, uh, she was a giver. She gave 10% of what I usually make my income for five and a half months and I wasn't even looking. That's the kind of Christian she was. And now my two kids, you see them and say, oh, there with me and Margaret, my son and my daughter. So 
I was on my own. My wife's in heaven. My kids will be there with me. Also, after she died, God gave me one of the most beautiful people in the world. Amen. Margaret. Miss Margaret. Everybody loves her, so I don't need to talk about her. So I wanted to just slow this whole thing down and say this is not about any physical effort. This is not about going across the Grand Canyon or laying it all on the field or whatever it is. It's about are you all in Amen. with God? Amen. Are you ready to just let him take over when he says, don't look back. Don't look back. When he says love, the way I tell you to love, you can say, I, you know, I can't do that. That's human and impossible. Holy Spirit gets to teach you. Amen. Holy Spirit will teach you how to love. So I just wanted to, I was been thinking about this because it took a while to say it. I didn't want to get up and take up pastor's time or anybody else's time, but Debbie did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I just, like I said, I just wanted to have people not, uh, how do people understand that this isn't, this isn't just an outward physical, are you gonna do, 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 that's just actually the totally wrong thing that we're talking about. Is God a God you can trust in? Or are you all in for him? Amen. Amen. Thanks, Dad. 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 Jeremiah chapter 1, and I'm going to kind of share where I'm going to go here tonight, and then we'll pray and go from there. But um, when I was in um, Israel, we saw things that I, that I had only heard of, and I I never, I heard of cisterns all my life, and but I never knew what they were specifically for in that era, in that context, and I never knew the literal gravity of them. And so Jeremiah chapter 1 talks about it. And so just to give you an example, at that time, they used cisterns to hold water. And um, they would normally have a, a city on a hill. And so the only way to get water, if there's no water down below, was to store water in cisterns um, on, on your property. And so they would dig a hole. And one cistern that we were in were lit was literally this size, the size of the room. And you had to go down some very, very steep stairs and very, very um, uh, low ceilings, and you'd get to the bottom of it. And <clears throat> the cistern was just chalky. It, the, um, the, uh, the walls were chalky. And when you would put water in there, the, the water would get kind of muddy or kind of uh, opaque. And so that wasn't the ideal form of water. The ideal form of water was to get water from a stream, water from a river. And so um, the cistern is the second best way, and then you have the third best way is the well. The well just sits there forever. And so here, Jeremiah chapter, does it chapter two? Okay, chapter two, there you go. It's just, there you go, two, two, one. <coughs> and it says this, it's, um, and, and I'm reading out the NLT, and then I'll, um, I'll switch over here in my keywords. It says, the, uh, the, Lord, uh, uh, the Lord gave me another message, he said, Go and, sh and shout this message to Jerusalem, his people. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. How you loved me and followed me through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty and disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. <coughs> Listen to the word of the Lord, people of Jacob, all your families of Israel. This is what the Lord says. 
what did your ancestors find wrong with me? Watch this. That, that led them to stray so far from me. They worshipped worthless idols only to become worthless themselves. <laughs> I'm getting chills already. Then it says, they did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us to safety out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, a land of deserts and pits, a land of drought and death, where no one lives or even travels? And when I brought you into a fruitful land to enjoy its bounty and goodness, you defiled my land and corrupted the possession I had promised you. The priests, watch this show, this is so painful. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who taught my word ignored me. The rulers turned against me, and the prophets spoke in the name of Baal, wasting their time on worthless idols. Therefore, I will bring my case against you, says the Lord. I will even bring charges against your children's children in the years to come. Go west and look in the land of Cyprus. Go east and search through the land of Kedar. And I've learned, just by being over there a few days, that every word, every, every word, every meaning, every, I'm sorry, every, um, every word, every city, every land, every direction has a meaning uh, in Hebrew. And so I went and looked up the, the, the word Kedar and where it was. And it's near Cyprus, today Cyprus. But at that time, Kedar is the second child of Ishmael. Okay? The second child of Ishmael. And when you look at the Hebrew meaning, it means dark skin. Now, dark skin because they always rose black camels. And so their tents were always made of black tent. And so they called them the dark skinned people because how, that's how they traveled. And so the key is this. You're wondering, well, God, what did these people of Kadar do? Why were they so evil? Well, as you look deeper and deeper in the history, Kadar is claimed by the Muslims as Muhammad's ancestor. So God knew what they were getting ready to do even before they did it, or what they were already doing. And so that's why he says here, it's his verse, um, verse 10, he says, go west and look in the land of Cyprus, go east and search through the land of Kadar, <clears throat> has anyone ever heard of anything as strange as this? And then he says, has any nation ever traded, watch this, its gods for new ones? So they have replaced Jehovah Adonai for something that is coming. Has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in, uh, in horror and dismay, says Lord. Now, here's where I'm going here, and I'm going to read out the, uh, the, the New King James. And this is where we are today as a people. It says, for my people, this is us, Christians, have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And they have hewn, or they have dug, cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. When you look at the word living water in the Hebrew, it's mainchayim. It means living water. It means flowing water, fresh, sacred water. So what they have done is that they've taken the fresh thing and traded it for a stale thing. They've traded it for the easy, convenient thing. Because if you do any kind of research as far as um, living out in the wild, you never want to drink the water that is flowing at the lowest level. You got to go climb. And so we look at that to us today as our Christians. We have traded off Jehovah, Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sikhanu, the living water, the fresh water, the alive water for something easy that we can get. If you can understand your God, it's not really a God. If your God is tangible by the touch, he's not really a God. He's an idol. And so as we continually grow as Christians, we always have to remember that we're still children. 
We're still children that, children that, that need a God. So then, let's take the Mike Chaim, the, uh, the living water, over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And you'll see Jesus here. And he's with the woman at the well. And let's go to verse 3. And it says, he, Jesus, he left Judah and departed again to Galilee. So, so Judah is south of Galilee. So between Judah and Galilee is Samaria. Okay, so he's walking up through Samaria to get to Galilee. He came to a city of, 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 of Samaria, which is called Sychar. It's, it's kind of like in the southeastern part of, of Samaria near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so it was noon. Now, I, this is just me. Jesus is going into a new land. He's trying to establish a new mindset, a new culture. And so we may think that he does things accidentally, but I kind of think that he does things intentionally because he knew that nobody would be out at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. That's like being out in Vegas at 12 o'clock in the afternoon in August. Nobody's out there. Nobody. You're either inside or you're inside, okay? So it's hot. And in that area of Samaria, there are no trees or very, very few trees or there are broom trees this high. And so there's no shade at all. So he says, he goes there around the sixth hour, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Why would she go out at, at, uh, at noon? Why would she go out in 110 degree heat? She was hiding. She had a secret. She had baggage, okay? He said, a woman came to Samaria to draw water. He said to her, give me a drink. Now you know he saw her coming. You, you know that he moved it in the word of knowledge, word of wisdom. He knew that she lived in the city. He knew that she was, what she was doing. So he says, hey, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city for, uh, to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, huh, how is that you being a Jew? Ask a drink of water from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That is equivalent to 1930. A white man coming to a water fountain, and a young black lady comes up in the 30s in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Texas, and he asks her, he talks to her first, sir, why are you talking to me? You're white, I'm black, you don't like us. So just so you can set the stage here, all right? He says, <laughs> he says, Jesus answered said to her, if you knew the gift of God, which is the mind Chaim, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, he is the mind Chaim, it says that in the Song of Solomon, you would have asked him, and he would have given you mind Chaim, living one. Because see, have you noticed that people who live a life, okay, let me read, people who are either sinners, hypocrites, backsliders, or halfway Christians, when they go away from church, the mind Chaim, and go to the world, the sisters, and then they come back into the church, the mind Chaim, the living water, they're refreshed. They're refreshed. But when we go out, we have to continually get living water. And we get living water from the living word, Jesus Christ. And so for 2020, and any year from that, when you begin to feel parched, it's because you haven't had any living water. Or you've gone too far without it. I started riding bikes long distance now, and I would notice that, you know, around mile 12, 13, 14, and that's not that long, really, um, for people I've been talking to. I, I was like, man, you know, I'm kind of tired, da, 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 you know, and so I'll start reading, and the longer you go, obviously, the more food you need, but also the more water you need. And they said that if you're going over 20, 30, 40, 50 miles, you need to sip and eat even before you need to sip and eat. Because when you get to mile 20 and you've only had a half a bottle of water, you're already dehydrated. And the issue is this. 
We can't begin to read the Bible when all hell breaks loose. We can't seek the mind Cain, the, the living water, when someone dies or when we go through a bad time. Or when we, can't, we have to be sipping all the time. A new way of words of sipping saints, huh? We've got to be sipping that mind Cain all the time, that living water, that bread, even that bread of life all the time. We've got to be constantly eating all the time. You cannot go into starvation mode. So if you as a Christian are wondering why you lost your strength, you're dehydrated, because you're not drinking the Mahayim, you're drinking out of a cistern. You're drinking out of a cistern. So then he goes on and he says, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with. See, she, she don't get it yet. She, she don't get it. She's still in her car of mind. The well is deep. Where, where then do you get that living water, that mind Cain? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered him and said to her, whoever, God's so good, whoever drinks from the world, whoever drinks from the job, whoever drinks from their family, whoever drinks from their friendships, whoever drinks from their income, from their looks, whoever drinks from the world will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that shall save him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So I'm going to say, sir, give me that water <laughs> that I may not thirst, nor come here again to draw. She still didn't get it. She said to her, go call your husband and come here. So now, now y'all, this is what I, and, and y'all, I've read this so many thousand times. People say that Jesus wasn't, not hard. They'll say, well, you know, Jesus was, he, you know, he loved us and he did. But he always gave them the, 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 the opportunity to repent. Because he knew what she was doing. Okay? And he says, well, you know, before I give you eternal life, salvation, let's talk about your life. And let's see if you're willing to give up your life for my life. So he says, um, go call your husband. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. The woman answered, well, well, I have no husband. And the fact that she didn't lie proves her steps towards salvation, her steps towards repentance. Well, he says, you have well said. Well, you didn't lie, girl. You have no husband. For you have five, or you have had five husbands, and the one whom you are have right now is not your husband. In that, you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're, that you're a prophet. Duh. Okay, our fathers worship. <laughs> She's getting it. She's finally getting it. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. You said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is in the Jews, is of the Jews. And watch this. The hour is coming, and is now, is when true worshipers, those who are drinking the mind Cain all the time, the living water, it's flowing, will worship the Father in spirit, the mind Cain, and also in truth, the, uh, the word of God. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. And then it says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So there, the story ends. And so my point all that tonight for us fasting is that, and I'm going to tell this to our men too probably in the next few weeks because we're getting ready to have our, our men's retreat in September. And... I mean, our, our men's retreats are just stellar. They, I mean, we have we are at such a high, it's such a crescendo. We want to stay there forever on the mountain. But you know what? Sometimes you, no, every time you, you got to come off the mountain and live life. And I'm going to tell you guys, you know what? We're going to have our men's retreat this year. But the other side of it is this. you got to stay connected. So when you leave this fast in the next three days, and life hits you February, March, April, July, September, December, and all hell breaks loose, or or 
you get blessed and, and, and then you don't really need God because now you got money, now you got access, now you got options. Remember the my Chaim. Remember all that. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And, you know, I right now don't know where Kobe Bryant is. I have no idea. He's in, I, all I know is that he's an attorney. That's all I know. I don't, I don't know where he is. But I'm doing a funeral tomorrow, Thursday. And I know where that man is because I led him to Christ. So the issue is that it don't matter what you got. I mean, his whole purpose of being in a helicopter was to be with his kids, his daughter, and and, and to be a better dad and to, and, to, and, and to quicken the commute to that area in Burbank. I have fallen in Burbank. That is a hellhole for mountain. Yeah. It is so dangerous over there that we have special had special restrictions on landing in Burbank. So I don't know where he is or those other eight people. But the issue is this. If we are getting my time on a regular basis and we step away and we stop sipping and stop drinking the bread, eating the bread of life and, and, and drinking his blood, when we die, because we will all die unless Christ comes, I don't want my wife wondering where I am. I don't want my kids going, well, daddy was a pastor, but you know, he he got disillusioned with church and then he started hitting my mama and then he left and and then I haven't seen him since. Yeah, then she chased him down and killed him. No, kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so, church, let's, let's you know, at, as we go to pray here, let's remember that as we leave here. Church, Christianity is not a sprint. It's not. It is a marathon, y'all. It's a marathon. And my wife said something last night, or that, I can't remember when it was. I want to throw her on the bus like I did Dave last week, but... <laughs> But she said something to the effect of, um, well, I, I guess I said it because I was, I remember being over in that parking lot when we were at the old building and I was facing, I was going out and for some, oh yeah, I, I went and paid rent and, and I got back in the car and, and, and God goes, Jerry, are you with me? And I said, what do you mean? He said, are you in this as a pastor for the long haul? And you know what's funny? I, I, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. Because I said, Lord, where else am I going to go? <laughs> you got me. The job's gone. But I come on. So, church, the point is this. When you are drinking living water, living water, you don't get burned out. Burnout is just the, the symptom of not drinking my time. You aren't in the Word. You aren't in the Word. You aren't in the Word. Get in the Word. Get in worship. Get in prayer. Get in praising. Get in the Word. And it's a continual Process. Process. You, you have to, God told me, Jerry, the church that prays together overcomes together. Yes. And we overcome how? By the blood of the Lamb yes. and the word of our testimony. Yes. That's it. Yes. So, hallelujah. Anybody got anything before we pray? Dave, you got anything? Chris? Good to see you, Chris. Good to see you. Hallelujah. Jeff, you got anything? Amber? Sean? Honey, cookie, sweet thing. Brian, you good? Yeah. Oh, the dust are always, they're spring loaded always. So you gotta watch that. All right, well, let's um, let's get in our prayer posture. So you can stand, walk around. Let's begin to focus on where God wants us to be after this fast. How, are, how will we live our lives day in, day out in this fast? How will we continually walk? in grace, walk in peace, walk in his presence in a prosperous way. Thank you, Jesus.
that we don't quit the race right before we get to the finish line, Father God. We just we just drink in your mind tiny, Lord, your your living water, your water that's alive and fresh, Lord Jesus.
this year, um, they're going to call you and they're going to need um, spiritual guidance on end. And, and you're going to have to be a, a parent and also a, spirit, a pastor. And so it must be done through discernment, through prayer, um, because they're going to come to you broken. I mean, just broken. And, um, Thank you. 
drugs. And she had, you know, she just was out of it. <coughs> because it hit her, her vagus nerve, and that is your, that's a part of your, your sympathetic nervous system, and it, it, it's, it's fight or flight. And she was fighting or flighting. And so when it was all said and done, she was kind of groggy.